So in this experiment, you're going to be studying the relationship between crater size and impact velocity. So we need to make some craters. So for this, you're going to need a pan and a drop cloth because there will be a bit of spray. And you want enough sugar, white sugar, to cover the bottom of this pan or container that you're using to about three or four centimeters. And then you want to level it off. So you can use white sugar for this. You could also use salt if you have a big bag of it. You can use dry, loose sand if you have that. You can also use flour, although it's a little messier and harder to level off. But it's your choice. You just want something that, when you drop objects into it, it's going to make a crater. Now, as I said, what we're studying is the diameter of the craters versus the speed that the projectile hit the sugar at. So how do we get the speed of it? Well, on Earth, you can calculate the speed of a dropped object. So as long as I'm not throwing it down, if I'm just dropping it, I can figure out how fast it's going when it hits the ground based on how high up it was when I released it. So that's what we'll need to do next. We need to mark off some intervals on the wall. And specifically, we're going to go in 25 centimeter intervals. So I want to measure up from the surface of the sugar, 25 centimeters, and I'll mark that with a piece of tape. And then I go 25 centimeters up from that and mark it as well. And I'll just keep going up the wall doing this. So I want to go up 25 centimeters each time. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be dropping the projectile from those heights five times from each height. And each time we'll measure the diameter of the crater. And then we're going to make a graph of the crater diameter squared versus the speed that it hit the sugar at. So the lab manual actually steps you through all the theory, and it's a little heavy for this lab. But what we predict is that the diameter of the craters squared should be proportional to the speed that the projectile hit the sugar at. And the speed we calculate just from the height here. So in terms of the projectile that you use for this, I'm going to use a little ball bearing because I can then fish it out with a fridge magnet. But what you want is just something that is small and dense. So a large ball bearing or a marble or a large glass bead. You could even use a coin if you got good at dropping it flat. So some small dense object is what you want. And like I said, I'm going to use the ball bearing just because I can then fish it out with my magnet. So each time what you do is you'd level off your sugar or whatever it is that you're using. And then you would drop your projectile as accurately as you can from the height. So I just drop it and I'd see a crater there. If you have any trouble seeing the crater edges, it often helps to take a flashlight and just shine it from a very low angle. But I can see this okay right now. So I would just get in here and measure the crater diameter as accurately as I can to the nearest millimeter. So I'd measure it once, fish out my projectile, level off the sugar again, and then again, as accurately as possible, drop it from the same height. You're going to drop it five times from each height. We'll be averaging those later. So you drop it five times from 25 centimeters, and then five times from 50, five times from 75, and so on. And you need six to eight data points to get a good graph. So that means you want to go up in 25 centimeter increments up the wall up to at least 150 centimeters. So that would give you six data points. You could also go up to two meters. That would give you eight. So you want six to eight data points for a good graph. And the point of the experiment is that we're trying to confirm the relationship that the crater diameter squared is proportional to the impact velocity. And of course, assuming that you had clean hands and clean objects, when you're all done, you can salvage your sugar and put it back. So after you've got all your data, you're going to average the crater diameter that you got for the five runs together, and that goes in this second table. So this is table two. So you'd put your heights in here and your average crater diameters here. Then you want to next calculate your impact velocity. So let me show you an example of this. So the impact velocity is going to be V is equal to square root 2 times G, the acceleration due to gravity, times H, which was the height that you dropped the projectile from. So that would be 2 times gravity in centimeters per second squared. So that's 980 centimeters per second squared 
times your height, and I'll use that first one there, 25 centimeters. And that gives you 221 centimeters per second. And so then I can put this in my column. You'd obviously do that calculation for all of these as well. This column is just going to be your diameter squared. So d squared is just going to be, for an example, So you do the calculations, fill in your data for table two. Now, once you have your data, you're going to need to graph your data. So first things first, you need actual graph paper for this. So not lined paper masquerading as real graph paper, but an actual piece of real graph paper. Now, if you don't have any graph paper at home, but you do have a printer, I have put a file on the website that you can print out and use as graph paper. But if you don't have either, then you're going to need to go to a drugstore or something and buy yourself a pack of graph paper. So graph paper can be oriented either like this or like this, depending on what's going to fit your data better. So feel free to do it either way. And generally speaking, the bigger a graph is, the more accurate it is, especially if you're calculating the slope, which we are not doing this week. But if you're trying to get any information off of your graph, a larger graph is going to be more accurate. So for that reason, please put your axes right along the edge of the page. So don't indent it by a block or two, but actually put it right along the edge of the page. And I'm working in ink so that you can see it well in the video, but you should work in pencil for graphs. So normally in the labs, you're required to use ink for everything, but graphs are the exception, just because it's very common that you would need to make a correction on your graph. So you use pencil and you want to label your axes well. So if you read in the lab manual, it tells you that you're going to be putting d squared, diameter squared on this axis, and velocity on this axis. So in terms of labeling, put down the entire quantity name, diameter squared, and its symbol, so d squared, and its units, so centimeters squared. And same thing on this axis down here, velocity or impact velocity and its symbol, V, and its units, so centimeters per second. For the title, try and put an informative title on here. I prefer that you put something other than just the axes labels again. So, for example, investigating crater size. And then next, you need to choose a scale for your axes, and this can be a little tricky. Now, what you're doing when you choose a scale is you're going to choose even increments, just like on a ruler, so even increments across the page, and then you would go and find where your data falls on that scale. You don't need to start at zero, and in fact, for our data, we probably don't want to, because we've got one data column here that starts a little above 200 and ends a little above 500. So if I started at zero at this edge of the page, I'd have a big gap, and then all my data would be squished in a band up here. So remember, bigger is better when it comes to graphs. You want the data to fill the page. So we don't want to start at zero. We'll start, say, at 200, so a little below where the first data point is. So we're going to start at 200, but then the question is, what sort of scale do I put on here to make sure I don't run out of space before I get to, say, 550, a little above the top data point? So here's a trick that I learned. Our top data point is 542, so we want to go above that. So let's say 550 is where we want to end up. And our lowest data point is 221, so let's choose something below that, so 200. So I want to span this range, so I'm going to subtract one minus the other to figure out what that is, what that range is, and that works out to be 350. So fine, that's the total range that I need to span on my graph. To figure out how big each block should be, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this number and I'm going to divide it by the number of boxes I've got on my graph paper. So let me count how many boxes I've got on the graph paper. So there's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17. So it's 17 boxes wide. So I divide 350 by 17 and I do that on my calculator and it gives me 20.59, but of course this is an awkward number, I'm going to round it up to 25. So what's this number, this 25? Well on my graph I'm going to have each block is equal to 25, and that should allow me to span the whole page and fit all my data on. So like I said, I'm going to start at 200 here, and each one block 
is going to be 25. So that means four blocks gives me 300. Another four blocks will be 400. Another four blocks is 500. And I only need to go up to 550. So I'm going to be able to fit all of my data on the page and it's going to basically fill up the page. There'll be a little bit left over here, but that's fine. So now I want to do the same deal on this axis here and make sure that I can fit all of this data on there. So again, our lowest data point is 17.6 and the highest one is 44.9. So we want to go a little below this one and a little above this one. So I'm going to choose 50 as how high up I want to go and 10 as my starting point. So one minus the other gives you 40. And then we want to take this 40 and divide it by the number of boxes that we have on the vertical scale. So let's count those. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. So I take my 40, I divide by 24, and according to the calculator that gives me 1.67. And of course that's an awkward number, so I'm going to round it up to 2. In other words, on my graph I'm going to start at 10 and every box is worth 2. So it'd be 2, 4, 6, 8, this gives me 20. 2, 4, 6, 8, this will be 30. 2, 4, 6, 8, 40. 2, 4, 6, 8, 50. 2, 4, 6, and this will be 58 up here. And remember my highest data point was 44.9, so I can fit everything on here just fine. So now that we've got our scales worked out, let's actually put the data on. So now I've got my data on the page, and you can see that it's not exactly linear, but it's basically following a straight line. It's pretty normal that your data points won't all exactly fall on a straight line, and it's worth your while when you've got one or two that look a little off to just double check that you didn't misplot it on the graph and that you didn't write down the wrong data point when you took your data. So you might want to even remeasure the data points just to see if you can get a slightly better line. But something like this is perfectly acceptable. Now the theory predicts that the diameter squared of the craters should be proportional to velocity. And that means if we plot diameter squared versus velocity, we're supposed to get a straight line. So I'm going to draw a straight line through my data as best I can. And it's okay if you don't hit every single data point. That's the nature of taking data. There will be a little bit of uncertainty. So you do the best that you can to represent the overall trend of the data. And then the question in the manual is, have you verified the theoretical relationship? And that basically means, did you get a straight line or not? Maybe with a few bumps and wiggles, but basically straight. The point here is that if we plotted diameter, not diameter squared, but just the diameter versus the velocity, we'd get a curved line. And it'd be really hard to tell whether it was the right shape of curved line. By plotting diameter squared versus velocity and getting what we expect to be a straight line, we can tell the difference between a straight line and a curved line very easily. The human eye is good at that. So that's why we plotted it like this, is if we're expecting to see a straight line and the data instead curves off, that's going to be really, really noticeable. So you would look at your data and say, does my data basically follow the straight line instead of curving off? If you can say yes, then you can say that yes, your graph verifies the theoretical relationship that was predicted between diameter squared and velocity.